My name is Pierce Blea. I'm an assistant professor of script writing and film production at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. If this is the first time you're tuning in, this is the Conversations Art and Cinema series where we interview various artists, thinkers, writers, idea makers across all genres of the media arts. Uh, welcome uh, one and all uh, to the Conversations Art and Cinema series. My name is Piers Galea. It is my privilege to have Patty Chalmers here with us. Patty received her BFA in printmaking from the University of Manitoba in Canada and her MFA in ceramics in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota. She has exhibited in group exhibitions on five continents in six countries and 32 states. And over the past 10 years, it had worked in over 90 exhibitions. Uh, Patty is a professor and the head of ceramics at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. She admits she might be slightly compulsive and she definitely likes to laugh at her own jokes. I included the humor there and maybe that's a great place for us to start. I love, love, love uh, the Mud Maid exhibit. I went and had a great two hours because uh, Paula opened up the exhibit uh, privately for us, which was fantastic. So we had sort of a lay of the land. Um, and maybe I need to read a little bit about uh, the exhibit. And for everybody that's here, I will share a bit of this too. Patty Chalmers uh, Mud Maid Museum is an exploration of folklore and legends that blurs the lines between myth and reality. Uh, Chalmers has created her own museum of catfish beings referred to as mud maids, believed to exist in the Mississippi River in a distant past. This unique concept of the museum within the gallery plays with the definitions of fact and fe fiction featuring artifacts created by Chalmers. The Mud Maid Museum exhibition reveals an alternate history a museum filled with artifacts from when mud made apparitions were encountered in American waterways. In the Mud Maid Museum, visitors will see books, wood carvings, photographs, rag dolls, diaries, letters, whisker oil bottles, and much more from the foggy past. And we just saw a little bit of that collection. And maybe the first one is the first one that I saw and documented, which was this one, the Mud Maid. 19 by Samuel James, probably one of my favorites. Um, and I, I maybe we need to start with a question because I just feel like I'm talking nonstop because I'm gushing about <laughs> this. I can't stop. So we started with humor. Um, there's obviously a lot of humor. There's the mix, mix of fact and fiction. Um, did you start with, because I did look up Pierre de Freddy. And there is a Pierre de Freddy that actually existed and was this like horrible person. <laughs> so obviously you're making a comment on how they felt about women and gender roles uh, in the piece as well and sort of, uh, sort of pointing a finger at it. But I, I was just curious, how did that sort of coalesce for you in this piece? And was it the same for all the pieces? Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I think that, um, so I, my degree in, um, I got a degree in history before I got my fine arts degree. And, um, and I always really was intrigued by um, some of the history classes I took where they talked about um, history being uh, often about a certain class and a certain people, and it wasn't about everyone. Um, and so I, I think that I mean I took a women in history class, and I took a a, a class that talked about um, propaganda and how uh, images got changed to tell a different story than what actually happened. And um, and those classes were really uh, they started me thinking a lot about how we how we form an idea of a truth. And um, and so those are that's where I start. So I start from what is considered the the fact or the truth of a history or a historical fact, um, and then I draw together pieces of um, 
uh, of cultural history, and then I just tack in my version <laughs> of a different history that gets involved in it. So the Winnipeg strike did happen. Uh, that um, the, uh, the that was the person who started the um, the Olympics, and art was supposed to be included in the Olympics, and um, I just think that having those histories, like we don't even know that history very well. So it's like to bring up that history and then to talk about uh, that well, shoving some mud made history into it is interesting to me. I also like the juxtapositions that you're doing too, right? So there's the whole fact that Pierre de Freddy thought that women are to be man's companion, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have Samuel James actually falls in love with a woman and then just abandons the whole project, mm -hmm. which is just so brilliant, you know? And so I'm, I'm curious because for you, uh, you know, it's the ceramics is the piece, but also the writing of it is also the piece too. So how sure. much of like going into you know, creative writing and, you know, were you thinking about looking at certain texts? Were you going into museums and then identifying how those were written or were they based on anything at all? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of, I've gone to a lot of museums, but also I think I was just thinking about how, um, how stories are told, I guess, and how, how there's a certain language there's this game called Balderdash. Um, and uh, in this version of it that my my family has, you um, it gives you the title of a film and then you have to explain the plot of the film. And, uh, and then you have to try and convince people that your plot of the film is the right plot of the film. And uh, what's interesting is the game makers didn't want theirs to be too erudite and like well-written because they didn't want you to be confused or think that the automatically know that the smart one was written by the game and so they it's actually if you play the game you can always tell theirs because it's kind of the stupid one <laughs> and I think about that kind of language and like how we read um information and how we expect it to be written and so I, there's this sort of shifting in how I think about uh, writing I hear wrote write those things again and again just to sort of get them to fit into what I think is how people write didactic information um, but I think that uh, it's it kind of um, Mostly I just think of the the writing of these things and the creation of these stories as being, there's this, there's this almost like a dance that happens. Like sometimes the piece leads the text and sometimes the text leads the making of the piece. It just depends on which way I approach it. Um, this, this writing was led by the piece itself because the piece, I made the piece before I wrote the story. And um, this is the Mississippi and culture artifacts that we're looking at right now. Oh yes, yes. Uh -huh. So then this one, I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to talk. So when I make the Mud Maid Museum, and this is my third version of the Mud Maid Museum, um, I try and tie things together uh, with the place that I exhibit. Um, these pieces I made for a previous exhibit of the Mud Maid Museum, um, and they were, uh, the first version of the Mud Maid Museum was on a boat on the Mississippi. And so I was trying to draw in places along the Mississippi as being where the Mud Maid existed. Um, the same thing is true of this Benjamin Franklin one where I exhibited the Mud Maid Museum in Philadelphia. And so I tried to tie it to Philadelphia in some way. So this is um, Ben Franklin who, actually uh, did uh, live uh, in London for a while and worked at a book publisher, which I've said that is the publisher of the book on the other side of the room. And that's where he learned about the mud maids. And then um, the, uh, he, so he charted the, charted the, the, the Gulf current, the, or the, yeah, the Gulf uh, uh, stream and uh, included a mud maid in the, the stream. And my story is that he never met a uh, mud maid, but 
but the idea of the mud maid um, existing came to him when he was working at this publisher ha publishing house in London, which he actually did work at, and that the book that was uh, had a picture of a mud maid in it introduced him to the mud maid. So I'm trying to cross things across the room as well as through history, so it becomes really kind of woven together. Oh, it's really fascinating. So it's almost like when you say the the written leads it versus the piece leading it, it's almost like when we're writing songs where a melody might lead the song versus the instrument leads the song. Yeah, right? for sure. So the writing is leading you in that way. And the other thing it makes me think of, and I don't know how much of an influence this might have been in your work, and I'm sort of shooting in the dark here, but uh, are you familiar at all with uh, Diane Wachowski, uh, no, the poet, and um, and she would also cr create sort of myths and uh, write from myths. So she has these George Washington uh, pieces that that she would do. Um, and the other thing that uh, for me, at least, this blend between fiction and reality that it makes me think of is really our encountering of the internet right now and, and authenticity. So yes. uh, I'm guessing you're reacting to that in, in, in different ways. So is, is that a direct uh, reaction to it for you? Sure, yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, the Mummy Museums, I mean, for the first version of it um, was, uh, was spurred by, like, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a long time before even I, I made my first Mud Maid Museum. And it was, I went to a museum in, in Banff, Alberta, which was uh, a, his, a natural history museum. But it was really a log, like an oversized log cabin. And it was a museum of a museum because it really wasn't, it's not how we preserve and present animals or natural history anymore. So the museum exists as this relic from the way we represented museums or way the way objects were represented and that was really intriguing to me like probably 20 years ago and that's what started me thinking about this idea um and so I had another uh version of the mud maids before I did the mud maids the river because I had my first exhibition of the mud maids on the river um and so that's what spurred it to be mud maids um, but I think the idea of like how we understand information is is at the root of it and like how information is presenting to us. So the inter the internet definitely is part of that. I think also like I remember a textbook that showed an image of um of cosmonauts, and you know, you'll have the cosmonauts, and then the next picture has got like some guy replaced by a bush. And <laughs> it's just like before Photoshop. And I think that that's also, I mean, I remember taking a class and we talked about the way um, photojournalists take a photograph of people. Like if they, we had family or friends of um, ours, their parents um, had a, 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 ga a, a carbon monoxide uh, problem in their house. And, um, and he was the chief of the fire department. And the, the newspaper guys came out and they, took photographs for so long and irritated them for so long that they finally, the picture they took was like them being angry from an angle that made them seem like, like the wife was angry at the fireman husband for having this carbon monoxide leak, which was not at all what she was angry about. It was about the photographs, but it was like they kept on pushing until it told a story with the photograph that wasn't a true story. And I think that that's really interesting. And I remember, um, teaching a class when I was in grad school about uh, how to look at photographs. And we were looking at a photograph of, of a, um, a couple sitting on a bed by an artist that I cannot remember for the life of me now, but they were sitting on the bed and it looked like they had had an argument. And I was asking these undergrads to tell us, tell the group what the picture was, like what was it about and what was the picture? And they're telling it like it actually is. Like the couple had an argument and there's this thing that happened and they're probably really angry because of this and it's, they're in a relationship because there's a bed. And I'm like, but who took the picture? And they all just had this moment of like, what? And I'm like, it's in a frame and we don't think of the person taking the photograph. If all of a sudden you think of the person in the room with these two people, then you change your view about what you think, what you are perceiving has happened. 
if you don't think of the photographer, you don't think of what's happened. In that same way, we remove the person who writes these plaques in the museum. We think, oh, it's just the fact. And there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting psychological thing that happens to people. And I can't remember what it's called. I'll, I'll, see, I'll see if I can remember it later, but it's named after a man and it's called a certain type of amnesia. Maybe you know what it is. Do you know this? Whereas like you can, if you read an article in a newspaper, let's say, and you know a lot about that material, that sub, the thing, the substance in the, the article, like let's say it's about ceramics for me. And I know a lot about ceramics and it's saying things about ceramics that is not true. Like that you can dissolve fired ceramics in water or something. And I'd be going, that's not true. This person has no idea what they're talking about. How can this even be published in the newspaper? But we have this form of amnesia that when we turn the page and the subject is about something entirely different, we trust it like it's something that's written from fact and truth. And we don't question that maybe there's flaws in that as well, because we don't know more about that thing. And I think that's part of this as well. It's just this idea of like, who do we decide is the authority and who do we let be the authority for ourselves? And when do we stop questioning things that are told to us? And, and yes, we have to trust certain people and certain information, but how do we form that trust? And that's a question I just am interested in. I'm interested in how we form the trust of what we believe. I love that. I love that it's both about the maker and then thinking about the maker and the sort of behind the scenes and the process of it. And that it also leads us into thinking about questions of authority. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's this two sided thing that's very very powerful. And as I'm I'm drinking from my my mud made mug now, we we go into our our next element, which is that this this piece is is sort of a a, a total installation, in a way because there there is no beginning or end. Because once we go to the gift shop, it still feels like. I'm in the space and I don't know if I have any any footage of the gift shop too before I turn it over to questions to everybody else but there's this sort of incredible you know once we get past the 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 creme de la creme of of the exhibit as we are told which is the skull um we have this incredible gift shop that you've created you know with all these pieces the bags that glow in the dark, the the night lights of the Mud Maid Museum. And I felt no separation. I felt like I was still in the exhibit and it was just such a joy for me uh, to have that. And I don't know if you're familiar with Ilya Kabakov's work. Mm -hmm. He also has this idea of the total installation. One of his uh, big pieces was Man Who Flew Into Space from his apartment. And so I think it 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 sort of uh you can think of your cosmonauts, but in the room there's a slingshot when you walk in, and then you see all the drawings for flying into space, and then there's just debris on the floor and no one's in the room. Uh -huh. And so there's the humor of, you know, he's he's actually flown to space. Um yeah, and the incredible plates and 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 the mug. And so <clears throat> were you when you were thinking of the gift shop, was this all part of it? Was this part of the previous iterations as well? Yes, yes. So there's always a gift shop. And um, and I think of the gift shop as this. Um, so there's, for me, I think that people go, oh, okay, the gift shop. And the thing about the the artifacts is that the artifacts, there's a few levels of, of, um, of like asking for trust in a way or belief or there's a few layers of lies, I guess, really is what it is, because the myth of the mud maids don't, it doesn't exist. Like I invented the mud maids, they don't exist. And people sometimes think that the mud maid myth existed be outside of my exhibition. And I just took this exhibition, the, the idea of mud maids and, and did something with it, but I made up the myth, like it didn't exist. And then um, all of the objects in the museum are um, trompe l'oeil or uh, are, uh, play versions of the thing, right? So it's not real books, it's not real anything. Um, even the vase that, or the jar that I made that is like meant to look like um, like an Adelaide Robineau piece, 
is um, it's not a real lidded jar. The lid stuck to the, the body of the jar and the cork in the bottle of the, the little jug that you see is um, is actually attached to the, I mean, I just made it so I didn't want anything to be real. Um, the, one of the things that is real is the trumpet, which you can actually play. Um, but most of the things are just these artifacts that are artifice. It's all artifice. Um, the stories are artifice. My family, uh, so all the images are ancestors of mine or relatives of mine. They're family photographs that I've photoshopped into other images. They're my grandparents and my great grandparents and my great, great, great uncle. And, you know, they're just like all these people because I wanted to tie it to my own history in some way. And all of the names are family names. And so I just thought that that would be an interesting way to make it all about this mythology to do with me. And then um, I think that the gift shop is meant to be this idea, like you step from this really murky, dark room into a well-lit room that's like supposed to have this feeling of relief in a way that you come into this, what's the truth? Like, it's like I'm, you're being sold these things and they are what they are. They're exactly what you said. But the thing is, you're still buying the mud maids. And so there's this idea of like how uh, sneaky uh, information can be and how you it isn't always um, it isn't always really specific to uh, to like oh it's, uh, it's super tricky and and sly sometimes it's just like really right out there like you buy a mud made mug you're saying that in some way the mud maids exist because they exist on this mug it's just a reality of it I think also this idea of like you go from this dark space to this light space and the light space has this quality of like, oh, it's light. It's that you're shedding the light. This is the truth of it. It's this marketed thing. And yes, it is. But I also think about it as this notion of I've, I've tried to make as many things as possible look like things that were made by other people. And so it's this thing where I've made all of those things, but they're supposed to be like sort of my shepherd fairy version of of uh, the mud maids and my Saul Bass version of like design for mud maids and my Disney version of mud maids. And, um, and I sort of tied that all together. Again, it's like this notion that it's all this whole thing. It's like, what are you buying? So it's like the whole thing is about you walk through this space and you're reading these things and you're kind of skeptical probably, or you're amused. And then you get to the other space and then you buy something in theory. And so that is, it brings up the idea of like, what are you buying? And that was exactly my experience, which is why I just kept buying uh, <laughs> things. And um, I, I love this one the most because of the word maybe, uh -huh. which, and what you're describing actually was the feeling that I had as I went through the exhibit and then went through the gift shop. It was that totality of experience of seeing each item one by one and then going through the gift shop one by one and then seeing this at the end and the maybe, and it, it made complete sense to me, right? Uh -huh. that, um, that it would be this thing that is being sold to me in the end. Well, may, maybe it's real, maybe it's not, you know, maybe, uh -huh. maybe yeah. it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that it's a critique on uh, capitalism in a way. And I'm sort of getting that much clearer now in, 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 in your explanation of it too. Um, so it's so intricate, It's it feels like, so many pieces. It, this is this incredible diamond. Um, I've asked so many questions. I've gone past my usual two or three because this is such an incredibly rich piece. But I'm going to open it up now to any uh, students or any faculty, anybody that wants to ask questions right now. And you can ask uh, Patty, and uh, I'm sure Patty will respond. And if no one has questions, I'll keep going. <laughs> I want to buy some of that stuff too. 
that's too bad the Zoom meeting doesn't allow for the for the gift shop to be here in reality. Uh, Patty, I just got a curious, uh, to, if you had used a material, a medium other than ceramics, and of course I'm so glad you didn't, but I mean, how would the viewer's response do you imagine be different if you'd, you know, used consistently metal or or, or glass for this, for example? Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it matters what the material is. It matters that it's not the right material or the right thing. I mean, that's what really is the, and uh, before I even, I, I should have said even before, Thank you for attending. Oh, of course. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> um, our pleasure. But uh, yeah, I don't think it matters like that it's, it's, I mean, it's the, it's the fakeness of it that matters. But it's interesting because um, I talked to people at the opening and they didn't, some of them didn't know that things were fake. And I mean, and that's okay. Mm. I mean, they're trusting, very, they're like very trusting. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, they might some of them are like pretty good fake things um but most of them are like no i'm don't i'm not that good at rendering things so there's a lot of things that are pretty clearly um like good interpretations of something and not it itself yeah mm, okay and no nasty letters from people who were led along the entire way and at the end had the rug pulled out from underneath them and you know, feel disgruntled by it all? I mean, I hope not, but... <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. And I see we have questions in the chat as well. Uh, Sonia, uh, Sun Kyung Kim asks, would you play the full video tour of the show? Uh, meaning uh, the one that I, uh, that I recorded, I think, is that what they're asking? Probably, I don't have one. Okay. Uh, this is just something I shot, so it's just I, I edited it together. I don't know uh, if it's necessarily um, it's very very short, but I, I'm happy to play it. And maybe as it's going, since there's no actual audio, we can we can mm -hmm. talk about other things, which is uh, the this idea of uh, the subterf subterfuge or creating authenticity or creating artifice. And you said that the people believe that it was real. Um, I'm also curious about whether or not you thought about your audience and whether or not when they went back into their own realities, would they start questioning the news stories that they got as being fact or fiction? Would they can question uh, their interactions as being real or not real? And was that uh, part of your intention? That's definitely part of the intention. I just, I, I had a, I guess I had a feeling like, um, I don't know. I mean, everyone saw, I mean, most everyone saw The Matrix and I have to tell you, it really screwed my mind. <laughs> and, and I think about this idea of like, what part of reality is real a lot? I know it's just a silly movie, but um, but there's something about that notion of like just starting to like question when you start to wonder um, that I think is it it leads to um, changing the way you think about things. And I think that changing the way you think about things, it's not just like being critical. It's it's a way of reexamining how we exist in this world and how. Um, how we relate to other people in this world. I mean, that's that's part of it, I think. Um, I think the thing, when I think about like people not being happy about certain things, the one thing I think I had concern about uh, in the making was um, that the people of Cahokia Mounds, <laughs> the museum itself might be annoyed at me. Um, but then I thought, yeah, they're not going to even know what happened. <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about it too much. But that was my that was my one concern is that maybe someone would be upset about it. Um, but uh, you can see in this image, those are those, that, those are that's my grandma and my uh, great aunts that are in that photograph. And they're all the baseball players. So my grandma's the one that you can see on the on the right hand side. Right. And uh, then the others. And then I and, and, you, and you photoshopped them in. 
And I photoshopped them into a baseball team. And then I made the badge for the uniform and then I photoshopped that onto their uniforms. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, making something that talks about uh, how we think about, how we, just how we think about uh, what we see and just being engaged, I guess, and not just accepting everything as exactly as it is. I mean, when you look at something and then look at it again, it's kind of like rereading a book, right? Like, I don't know how many people reread books, but it's, it, I find it really rewarding. And I think that, uh, or read something that's not all that pleasing and it's kind of painful um, because it's not really what you want to be reading and how that can be really rewarding as well. It's like taking good medicine. And I think that this is sort of like part of that. It's just good medicine. Yeah, I hear you on that. It also reminds me of Jorge Luis Borges, um, some of his uh, 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 poetry and fiction, especially in labyrinths. There's these, these sections where, um, you know, people have talked about when certain things are um, <clears throat> described, they don't go into another part of the room. Mm -hmm. So you don't know if that actual part of the room exists in, in a fiction. Uh, right. what, what, what is actually there? And, and I think you're touching on that. And I think the other part of it for me is, you know, there's this interesting thing of the stories that we believe and the stories that are we think others have. And mm -hmm. is that story true within our mind? And so I think almost touching even Zen Buddhism and, and things of like koans and and, and were you thinking of, of those sorts of things within spiritual realms as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that there's a sense for me of uh, of truth. So truth to me is spiritual, right? It's like, how do you define what is true for you? Um, and I think that it, like trust, so both of those things, I think faith is all about trust, right? So to me, it's, it's definitely ties into this notion of uh, how we... Uh, how, like how we believe and then what we believe and then trust in uh and faith and yeah all those things I think tie into the idea of um of uh a belief system which is your faith perhaps you know yeah and I see Carolina has their hand raised you can go ahead and ask your question no hands need to be raised <laughs> hi Patty um I I love what you've done here and listening to you talk as well about the different levels of simulacra that you have going on, not only in the, the museum exhibit, the way that you portrayed the authenticity of kind of a museum experience and then also the gift shop. And looking through it and listening to you talk, I've just also been listen, thinking about the different mediums that you've borrowed for that kind of authority like part of it is the printed uh, aspects of the labels, the way that you've set it up, including the gift shop that also has our consumption authority. That's what we expect a gift shop to look like. And you have all of the other knickknacks. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit perhaps about what the authority of the ceramics are and part of the exhibition. Does ceramics have an element of that that is similar or does it borrow authority from other places in order to to create that because a lot of the works that you have manipulate elements of ceramics throughout history but you're the expert on ceramics so i'd really like to know what the authority from ceramics is yeah that's it that's really it. thank thank you for attending and thank you for coming to the show again that was lovely um yeah, the I, ceramics authority. It's interesting. So I think ceramics works really nicely in uh, for the objects in the the uh, museum, uh, in part because there's a real history of trompe l'oeil in ceramics, which is interesting to me, and also um, because it's fragile, right? So we make something, and it's it's we think about ceramics, and we think fragility. Um, and so I think that these objects have this sort of quality of being uh, hard and also fragile. Um, I think also there's, um, 
maybe uh, for, in ceramics, the, the ceramics are often in the museum, but they're in a certain area. And, um, and it's, uh, if they're in, like, I think about the St. Louis Museum, for example, there's the historical area of of the um, of the museum, and that's where you'll find a lot of ceramics. And then you get into the art part, and um, there's a lot of painting and um, other such you know sculptures out of other materials than uh, ceramics. There are are decorative arts interspersed and dispersed and that museum is probably uh, better at interspersing things than a lot of other museums, but it is pretty separated in a lot of the uh, areas like uh, there's a lot of ceramics on the front end of history because that's what survives. And so it's also this idea of like archivalness and that things exist and they survive. And then there's uh, this, this the idea that they're kind of excluded in a way. So you know, and I've always been for the underdog. So, I mean, it makes sense to me that I like ceramics so much um, because it sort of feels a little bit like an underdog. Uh, but um, yeah, as far as the authority beyond that, I don't really know. I I think that, um, that uh, it is such a good mimicker and uh, it can stand in as anything almost. Like you can make ceramics look like almost anything. And I think that's it's it's such a chameleon and I love that about clay and um and so I think that having uh, a material that can look like almost anything is just so like great it's sneaky it's a sneaky material but it's also a base material right like we think of clay as like this base material it's from the ground it doesn't have value in its raw form. I mean, we pay for shipping of something that the shipping costs more than the material itself um, because it's heavy, but it's not valuable in that same way that we think of gold or silver or wood or those other materials that um, are, are not as, or, or have much more value intrinsically. Um, and so that's also appealing to me. Um, and so it's base and it's, and it's, uh, it's, yeah, I think that those are the things that that make it's also when it's when it's not fired, it's soft and malleable and it is something that can change and you can make it be what you want it to be. So I think of that as in a way that when we think about like um, Prometheus or, you know, we think about mythology and 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 Christianity or uh, uh, even like the idea of the golem, right? Everything like figures being made out of clay. I think that's interesting to me, like word play in some way. Um, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question, Carolina? Yeah, it does, because it sounds like what you're saying is that ceramics or the medium in itself, because it's so malleable, that it also kind of undercuts a lot of the exhibition's premise of being simulacra that it needs the rest of it to kind of bind it together but that's the beauty of the material of the the medium that you've chosen to kind of exhibit with that it has that kind of ability to to shape shift like that's right the mud made yes. it herself right so yeah so it does thank you thank you And with the talk about ceramics, I'm also curious about, uh, at least for me, my interest in cinema, um, because uh, you know I've I've also been exploring fact and fiction, as you know, and, and that is my main game. So it's very interesting yeah. that we're playing in the same arenas. Uh, but I'm I'm very curious. Have you thought about using cinema and and mixing ceramics? as a production tool or even making cameras with ceramics or other things. Um, I'll stop there before I yeah, go. No, I just have a, I had a question. So when you say cameras, you mean like actual cameras or making sculptures of cameras? Either or, I was thinking. I have made sculptures of cameras, mm -hmm. um, many cameras. I've made uh, the Kodak box camera. I've made a, uh, 
uh, Diana camera. I've made a Kodak, like Instamatic. I've made a lot of cameras, Super 8 cameras um, as sculptures, um, as objects, because I've made a lot of objects uh, to stand for memories of things. Um, but using clay as part of uh, video or film or, um, uh, yeah, not so much. I think uh, I'm more, I would be more inclined. So I've taken, I've made animations in the past where I've used, I do Photoshop with to make the animation, but I've used images of clay sculptures, parts of them as parts of the animation that moves, but it's a still image of a sculpture that's part of the animation. But I haven't really made, I don't, I'm not, I don't know that it, like the idea of claymation doesn't really appeal to me that much. Um, but I like the idea of like, I mean, I love cinema, I love uh, films, uh, going to like, I love watching old films and films. And I did a lot of film studies and I took photography and I, I'm interested in the way image tells stories. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the, the substance or the quality or the thing that happens that carries a lot of the, the story uh, besides the objects are the photographs that go along with them in the museum. And, um, and I really like the idea that you have this patina of time through an image, like you can talk about this past time and it's because the images are old images, but even though they're Photoshopped, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested in some kind of, I mean, I like narrative a lot and I thought of myself as a narrative artist. I mean, at first I thought I was a figurative artist because I used a lot of figures. And then I thought of myself as a narrative artist. And then I think, I don't know if I am a narrative artist. Like I thought I was a storyteller. And then I thought, well, maybe I'm not that either. And I used to think like I would take, I would invite people into a boat and I would paddle them out to the middle of some water and I would then say, which direction you want to go on the water? And now I think I'm more inclined just to say, here's a boat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Well, I'm always willing to, to go in the boat and to experience whatever you want to do. And it, it also seems to me like as far as writing though that might be a possibility where these could be a book and mm -hmm. um then you would have panels right where the ceramics would be the panels within the book and have you thought about that i have and actually if i like i it's always time right i ran out of time um i wanted a coffee table book because i thought that would be a really nice uh addition to the gift shop um, but even after the, the show is down, I think I'd still work on a book of the objects. I don't have a website for it yet either. And I think it'd be interesting to put it on a website as well. Although I don't want it to be like uh, too much on like, but internet can be a little bit uh, complicated in terms of how you put too much, if you put too much of a mysterious thing out there, it becomes less mysterious. And I kind of want it to continue to have the aura of like mystery. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of explaining that goes on, even even on in, on Instagram and Facebook. When I post things, people get confused, and then they want me to explain, and I will explain. But so I so you didn't ask me about the jacket, which <laughs> my blazer in the show, um, and there's a blazer in the show. And uh, and that's the um, my costume of the curator, and I um, I put on the blazer to talk about the museum. And when I'm in the blazer, it's all real. Because I had this idea that I can't. It's like they're walking this line between it's true, it's not true. I don't want to like just stay in a character where I'm always saying it's true when it's like part of the the interest of it is that. If you don't know it's made out of clay and I tell you it's not made out of clay and then you think it's not made out of clay, then it's not, it's kind of loses some of its impact because the idea that it's made out of clay and it's a fake is part of the allure of the whole exhibition. So when I think about uh, putting on the jacket, I can talk about it as it being real. And as soon as I take off the jacket, 
then I can talk about it being fake. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, it, it also reminds me of the filmmaker Abbas Kiarostami. Mm -hmm. And he had a piece that went into a, a museum. I think it was called uh, Seagull Eggs, I think it was. Okay. And it was a 17 minute uh, video piece where basically there are three eggs uh, and the water is coming as the, uh, the sea is coming. And one by one, the ocean takes the eggs. And then afterwards, all the people, when he shows this in the gallery, they run up to him and they're just, they say, oh, say, oh you know, that was so amazing oh, that uh, you ended up being able to uh, uh, do that and you were there at that exact moment. And then Kiristami is always like, no, no, it was all fake, you know? Um, you know, I was there with 50 eggs and we had to plan this. I did, it took two months to shoot it, to edit, to make it look like it was real. Yeah. And he's like, all cinema is an illusion. It's just, it's mm -hmm. all fake, you know, but for him, he said that he loves to let people know about the magic trick. And I, and I think it's very interesting for you that you had the blazer. So why did you feel like you needed the blazer to reveal the magic trick? Well, no, I don't wear the blazer to reveal the magic trick. I wear the blazer to tell, say that there is no magic trick. It's all true. Yeah, yeah. That there um, is no magic trick. Yeah. yeah, and I think and there was it was basically, um, I think I came up with the idea because there's this museum in uh, in LA called the Museum of Jurassic Technology. And uh, and I found out about it a few years ago, and and I read a book about it. And what I learned about it was that the um, the uh, curator of it or the owner of it, the guy who does it, uh, something Wilson, I can't remember his first name. He um, he will never break character that it's real. And so there's this kind of confusion about it, which is interesting, I suppose. But there's also um, like you can't if you never admit that it's a fake or if you never say that it's fake, if you say it's always say it's real, then it loses some of the. Um, the it's like that moment when someone tells you something, you go, oh. I mean, I remember when I was um, it's that when you realize what something means, like I remember listening to this American Life and this woman was talking about the uh she calls it the zing moment because when she was walking across the street there was a sign that had duck crossing with like the x and then the ing and uh and she said oh look duck zing and the guy said no it's crossing and she didn't know until this person told her and she's an adult and she should have known but she didn't know and she had this zing moment I had the same thing happened to me when I was in college where I thought my mom was calling me a numpskull, which I thought was like a cute little numpskull. And I realized when I was in my fine arts degree that she was calling me a numb skull. <laughs> and that was that moment where I went, oh, you're not very nice. <laughs> but also like that moment of like, oh, I guess I protected myself from thinking she was being mean all those years <laughs> by not understanding. Yeah, but I, I think that, that, I love that idea that it's a zing moment that you have yeah. to reveal it. Yeah, and some people do not, and you're so right about it. I mm -hmm. see that uh, Greg has had it, uh, had their hands raised for a while. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I'm, uh, hi. Hi, Patty. I'm Greg Matthews uh, at Florida State University in Tallahassee. I'm the uh, ceramics lab manager, and uh, Sarah Miller told me all about her wonderful experience with you over oh. the summer and brought back some great ideas and has kept making things. And I uh, right. have another student here watching to her, an alum watching. So it's really, really nice. And uh, Catalina is our common connection to know each other from that. I've been, I really like this exploration of, like you said, just enough to let people discover what's really happening behind the scenes or behind all of it. And I 
uh, kind of, do you know of a uh, Butch Anthony Seal, Alabama, Lower Southeast Alabama? He has the Museum of Wonder and also the Drive Through Museum. Okay. Commonality is largely the vitrines, which is interesting, but his stuff, you don't quite know. Again, whether it's there, whether it's real, it's all made out of real things. He has a lot of stories about people who've sent him a, a ring that was lost 40 years ago and someone was plowing a field and they found the ring. That's all part of it. And mm -hmm. yeah, whether it's real or not, it's certainly entertaining. I really like that exploration of the kind of the the questions that arise with everything from, like you said, the matrix, the artificial intelligence, the things that could be from prehistory, but were maybe just someone's imagination, which at what point is it imagination? At what point is it what's really happening? I mean, that person's perception led to that thing. So anyway, it is really nice to explore all of that. And I was pretty excited to hear about it, uh, about your exhibit last night when I was <laughs> walking out of the other studio here and talking to Catalina on the phone. So thank you for including us. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. I um, uh, it's funny, you know. Uh, it's the idea of the the didactic information is something that's also interesting to me. We had um, Dario Robledo come here as a visiting artist uh, years ago when I first came to SIU, and um, and he had this piece which I thought was really beautiful, which was uh, a cast of two pelvis bones. Um, that were uh, made out of, um, they were cast out of the LPs that his parents listened to when they first started dating. And wow. so then he, and then he joined them and he hung them on the wall. And the thing is that he's very mysterious. He's, and he, and he tells these stories and he writes this, these things down and you don't know if it's true or not, but it doesn't matter because it's such a lovely idea that you, and in, in a way, like if it's not true, it's kind of exciting in one way and if it is true it's it's kind of simple and and poetic in another way and it's just like to me the idea that it could be either or both at the same time is like it's like like as they say the artist's uh philosopher schrodinger right it's like both at once right love that idea of both at once and um and i think that that's really appealing i remember we had a visiting artist here years ago who um, had this piece and it was, I mean, basically it was found objects that he made into a piece by just putting them in the gallery together. And he was talking about how it was, um, it was transformed, but it was still the things that it was. And I, he did not like me very much because I asked him, um, so is it like the difference between, between by, uh, in being Catholic or being Protestant? in like the Eucharist, right? So like a Catholic says, when it becomes art, it is, it, or when you when you have, when you have bread and wine, it's becomes blood, blood and bread, and it is no longer bread and wine. And then there's some Protestant faiths who say it's symbolic. It's like, yes, it's, it, it's kind of symbolic of, of bread and wine, but it's not, uh, it's not blood and, and it's, it's symbolic of, of blood and, and body. It's, but it's not. And then there's the Lutheran church, which is, and I may be other churches as well, but it's the one that I was raised in, which is it's both at the same time. It's so it's blood and it's, and it's wine and it's body and it's bread and they're both. And I said, so you're kind of saying that this piece is, is like the Lutherans, it's both art and it's object. And he was just, no. <laughs> and I went, okay. But I think that that idea, maybe because I was, I was, you know, went through the Lutheran church when I was a kid, I feel like um, maybe that's part of it. This idea of the potential for something to be two things at once is really appealing. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate you showing up. I survived uh, being raised Lutheran as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can I raise my hand again? <laughs> oh, I, it just occurred to me, by the way, Pat, it just occurred to me, and I feel, feel like an idiot, that of course clay is the perfect medium for this because it's all about a mud maid and 
clay is made out of mud, so the entire show is made of the substance of the mud maid herself in some sense. It's funny, you know, it's like that someone brought that up to me the other day and I was like, first of all, they said, I'm a mud maid. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then later someone said the same thing and it never even occurred to me. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, it never even occurred to me. Um, and I think it's because we always say that clay is not mud because it's, it's not, it's clay. It's not, it's alumina and silica. Um, <laughs> It's, it's not, it's not organic material. So it's not, it's not what we think of as mud, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it is mud, like it's dirty. It's mud. It's like the muddy river. It's, you know, it has that kind of quality, but yeah. Yes. And it works. It works beautifully actually. But my question was totally unrelated. So I, I've, I've seen enough of your art over the years to know that you have a, a, a deep, I think command of, and also fondness for just Americana of various types. And, and even here, I see it in your pressing into service of, you know, iconic American figures like Benjamin Franklin and, um, uh, 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 oh, the, you know, the river boats and, and, and mm -hmm. couples walking across the river bay. But I also know, of course, being Canadian, that you have, you must enjoy some outsider's perspective on, on Americana. And so I would just love to hear you talk about what it's like to be a Canadian and to be able to see American culture from the outside. And it must look far weirder to you in some ways than it does to us. Do, do you help tap that kind of, does it bring out your ability to see the, the, the craziness or the whimsicality and things that Americans just take for granted? It's so interesting that you say that because I, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I mean, we grew up with this, like, it's not like growing up in a country where, like you probably had a more foreign experience, Mont, um, growing up in Germany than, than and a less American experience than I did growing up in Canada because we grew up with American television and American um, uh, pop stars and all of that American stuff that, that but, but then there's also just a tang, like it's almost like, there's a the tang of Canadian added in like there's like the maybe it's that it's um uh it's that the substance is pretty much the same or maybe it's the yeah the Canadian is like the maybe it's the sauce that's put on top that makes it like a little bit different um but the 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 meatloaf is still the same <laughs> it's just got a different sauce maybe um maybe it's poutine rather than just chips uh, and I remember actually someone saying, or one of our colleagues uh, telling me that she scolded me for never telling her about chips and gravy. And I said, what? And she said, like, you go to a restaurant in Canada and you can get French fries and they put gravy on it. And I said, well, I thought that everywhere had that. I don't know. I mean, that's just, you grew up with it. But um, I don't, uh, I think that I mean, yes, there is a little bit of that Americana thing. Like, it's interesting to put my relatives in the U.S. Like to me, because all of my family members were either in Europe or in in uh, that are the photographs are from um, Europe or from Canada, and so it's interesting to do that. It made me like go like, oh yeah, my grandparents who are now Minnesota or uh, Minneapolis, uh, um, uh, you know people hanging out and like going to speakeasies, which, you know, wouldn't be their wives anyway. But um, to me, it's interesting to, uh, to think, oh, yeah, you're, I'm making them into someone totally different than they were. And that's just part of the narrative, right? It's like they become actors in my play. So in, in that way, I think about the, the I mean, and my family um, isn't necessarily uh, paying that close attention, like my, my, uh, my, relatives my other relatives aren't paying that much attention to what this is and who these people are that I'm representing so I don't know how they take it I mean because they're their family too and I'm just sort of like using them as my actors um but I feel like it's a way of I mean my dad is obsessed with the family tree and so or he was obsessed with it. he was like going on ancestry.com and whatever and doing this whole family tree thing and um and I always found it kind of um, the most in interesting part for me was actually finding out things about 
their lives, like who they were as people, just knowing people's names and where they were from and the day they were born and when they died doesn't really tell me much about an individual. And if that's all that's left of me, it's kind of like a disappoint disappointment to me. I think it's like to know that they, uh, maybe someone was a baker or someone like, just even to be able to imagine what they did. But because I don't know a lot of what the people in the family history did, I could just make up what they did because that's, I mean, we used to, we used to go to basketball games when I lived in Ohio and um, they had this sheet that would explain the majors of the basketball players. It was a weird thing, but they would tell the majors and where they were from. And I would start creating like a narrative in my head about who they were because I found ba basketball kind of boring. And so I would just look at them and I go like, oh, the little art history student or, oh, there's that kid that's taking economics or, you know, whatever. And I would start like imagining who they were off the court. Yeah. I see, I see, thank you. You're welcome. I love this myth maker. I, I don't know, maybe Mont knows the, the proper term. I think it's euhumorism is a myth maker. Is that right, Mont? Oh, you, you. you um, how do you say it? I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but I know the term. It's usually more often referred to a, to a, a mythological idea that, um, that myths have their origins in real human beings in their lives, but who become mythified over time and kind of become legendary, mm -hmm. uh, which I, you know, it kind of appeals nicely here because it would, it would play in the thought that really maybe there was an original mud maid who became mythified over time. Although, you know, we know that that's not the case, but maybe that's, we're invited to think that for the exhibition. It also makes me think of, you describe yourself as, you know, what type of storyteller are you? Are you a narrative storyteller? And that Mont brought up that, um, you know, you didn't even realize the, the mud maid was made of mud and that you are the mud maid. So uh -huh. maybe you're kind of a storyteller of the unconscious in, in a way and and bringing, bringing the unknown into a knownness and um, it, it's such an interesting thing that you were a third culture kid as well. So there, there's just this wonderful, uh, uh, rich texture to all that you're doing. Uh, and it's been such a pleasure to, to talk with you and learn more about your work with Mudway. And I hope that we can have many more conversations over the years and, and together. And thank you to everyone that's that's been here and been able to enrich this uh, conversation so much more with your questions to Patty. So let's all give her a, a, a nice round of virtual applause or real applause. Just an incredible artist. We're, we're, we're really so thankful and grateful that you're here with us at, at a second. Thank you so much, Bruce. I really appreciate the invitation. It's been really fun. And, and thank you everyone for giving up so much of your evening to listening to me blather on. Thank you. Sharing your time. Good night, everyone. Thank you.